Hello and welcome to Special Topics in Language Studies in English, Culture, Society and Politics with me, Richard Pinner. Today's class, we're going to talk about authenticity in language learning. We'll be looking at what real language is and the value judgments that we make, which might be especially tied to things like social class, uh, race and nationality when it comes to uh, speaker varieties. And this links to the previous lecture on uh, global English and different varieties of English around the world. What we'll talk about today in this 40-minute video lecture is first the definition of authenticity, um, the philosophy and the realities behind authenticity, uh, especially in language learning and teaching, but also more in general as well. Then we'll talk about what is real, because authenticity concerns itself with realness. It's the opposite of fake. So we'll talk about what is real when we're talking about language teaching and what is real language when we're talking about language materials. And finally, um, I'll put out some questions and we'll, we'll have a kind of a discussion about how this relates to learning and teaching foreign languages, especially English. So just a quick review about the things that we've covered before. Uh, we have already talked about global English and the different varieties of English that are spoken around the world. We've talked about the problem of the native speaker and the fact that uh, the native speaker enjoys uh, too much privilege in the world of language teaching. And uh, it, it, it's sort of a mythological concept. It's very difficult to, to actually define what is a native speaker. And then we also talked about the socio-cultural aspects of learning languages. And uh, last class, we talked about the psychology of learning. Uh, we discussed uh, emotions, we discussed anxiety, and we just discussed identity as well, and how there are many uh, different aspects of our identity. When, Especially when we learn a language, we kind of acquire a new identity uh, that's a growing identity um, as, as we gain proficiency in the language. So these are all things that we need to keep in the back of our minds in order to approach today's lecture. So lost in translation or already vague, the word authenticity, what does it mean? Is it something um, that we can easily define uh, is it something that can easily be translated into other words? Uh, there are many synonyms uh, with authenticity. Real, genuine. Uh, uh, authenticity has links with words like authority as well. Um, and obviously the opposite words, the synonyms such as uh, fake, uh, false, hoax. So here's uh, an example of authenticity at the kind of base, basic level. So this is, this is something that I'll call artifact authenticity. Uh, this re refers to whether or not a thing is real or not, authentic or not. So um, the watch on the left is a genuine uh, Swiss watch. And the one on the right is a replica, a fake. Uh, one is worth um, hundreds of thousands of dollars and the other is worth about 20. What is it that really distinguishes these two things? They both tell the time. They both have the same logo. But one is higher quality, better made. You can sort of, if you know what to look for, you can actually see with, with your own eyes uh, the finer detail on the writing of the left authentic watch. You can see the uh, more carefully wrought uh, bracelet of the left watch, the slightly better quality material as well. So if you know what to look for, it's easy to spot something that's real from something that's fake, if, if you know what you're looking for. 
But this, as I say, refers to artifact authenticity. How do we know when we're talking about language or when we're talking about something personal like your identity? The word authenticity comes from the Greek word authenteo, which meant to have full power. The word's made up of two parts. Auto means self, and hentes refers to the doer or being, and thus uh, the word authenticity has etymological roots with the word autonomy. Uh, autonomy is made of the word self, auto, and nomos, as in law or self-governing. And these two concepts do link themselves up um, very strongly, as I will talk about in a moment. So uh, let's just quickly talk about uh, authenticity again in terms of these two paintings. Which one is the authentic artwork? The one on the right or the one on the left? I don't know if you can see clearly enough, but uh, the one on the left has a little moustache and a beard drawn on with pencil. So probably most of you are going to suggest that the one on the right is the authentic piece of art. And you're right, the one on the right is um, a picture, I should say, of the authentic piece of uh, art known as the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And this painting is currently hanging in the Louvre Museum in Paris, and um, it's one of the most priceless pieces of art on the planet. However, the one with the moustache is also actually an authentic piece of art, only this time it's by Marcel Duchamp. And um, this, this one is actually quite interesting because there are different versions of this one. So not only is it also authentic um, as a piece of art, but there are many versions too. So which version can we say is the most authentic one? The 1919 one or the 1964 Rep 38 replicas. So this uh, is already just a postcard, which is a replica of the Mona Lisa. So um, if you buy a postcard of the Mona Lisa and draw a moustache on, that's not an authentic piece of art unless you are Marcel Duchamp, which you are not because he's dead. So even if you own one of these 38 replicas of the original one, are they, they, they are still authentic uh, works of art by Marcel Duchamp. So this question of authenticity can easily be complicated um, when we start thinking about all the different versions that are out there. Another example would be this uh, piece by British artist Damien Hirst. Uh, the famous shark in formaldehyde. And uh, this, this piece is called The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. And it made quite a big sensation. In fact, it was actually first shown in the Sensations exhibit um, in the Saatchi Gallery. And uh, it was purchased for uh, several hundred thousand pounds so it was a lot of money, enough money to buy a house. Somebody bought this. Um, but the problem with it is that um, when Damien Hirst was making this piece, it was the first time he'd ever uh, tried to preserve a shark. And um, just a minor criticism, he actually hired an Australian fisherman to hunt and kill this tiger shark just for this artwork. So if he really wanted to preserve the shark, he shouldn't have made the artwork in the first place. But never mind about that. That's just a side side mention. So, But uh, he didn't know anything about preservation techniques, and he didn't use the right mix of formaldehyde. And so the shark rotted and went bad. Um, and the person who bought it uh, ended up having spent hundreds of thousands of pounds for a rotten fish. So after that, uh, Damien Hirst caught or had commissioned someone to catch another shark and made another version of the shark in formaldehyde. 
Um, this time he he did it properly and, and had it properly preserved. However, which is the original shark? Which is the proper one? Is is the original one the rotten, mouldy one, or is the which is the authentic one now? You know, uh, this is a difficult question, and this is a question which has been posed um, throughout history since at least the time of the ancient Greeks, um, and it's often referred to as the ship of Theseus problem. So um, the story of the ship of Theseus goes that um, the ship that Theseus sailed back from uh, his adventure with the Minotaur uh, was preserved on the dock in Athens. And um, the wood, because it was a wooden ship, the wood uh, slowly started to rot. So uh, some of the planks that rotted were replaced um, and after time, basically all of the planks of wood that made up the ship had rotted and been replaced. So after a while, the ship had was completely different. It was a completely different ship. All the wood on the ship had been swapped or replaced over time. So the question was asked, is it still the same ship? If all the wood is new and all it's all been replaced... Is it still the same ship? Same with the shark. Same with Shakespeare's globe in London. Same with Toyama Castle as well. All of these uh, buildings are brand new. All the bricks are new. They're not the original bricks from the time uh, when when the building was originally erected. But you know, is it still the same building? Another issue with authenticity is that people don't really always know what's authentic. Um, there's a famous story that Charlie Chaplin came third in a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest. So the judges of this contest uh, obviously didn't recognise Chaplin and uh, thought that someone else looked more like him than he actually did. Now, what's interesting about this story is that when I tried to verify this, I found that it's actually an urban myth. There's no evidence that this actually happened, but it is a famous story nonetheless. So, especially in today's world where we have a lot of access to different types of information coming from lots of different sources, um, it's very often quite difficult to be certain of the authenticity of the information or the stories that you're hearing um, and therefore, authenticity is a very important modern concept for us to, to, to be concerned with. And it has links with things like critical thinking and checking your sources. It has links with things like the media and the newspapers and false, um, fake news and that kind of thing. This is one of my favourite quotes. Don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it, says Abraham Lincoln. And obviously, this is not designed to actually trick anyone, although I did find on uh, Yahoo Questions somebody who was tricked by this uh, rather hilarious picture. But um, this this picture is supposed to uh, ask you to kind of question the things that you're reading and make sure you check your sources and check your facts. Again, it's concerned with the nature of authenticity. So authenticity, as I mentioned earlier, has a close etymological link with the word autonomy. They both have the auto self and they both have quite similar original meanings as well. And I don't think you can really have authenticity without having autonomy as well. And I don't know if you can have autonomy without authenticity. And the third thing that I'll add to this mix is the word motivation. So as I said, when I studied authenticity, I was approaching motivation from the perspective of authenticity and looking to see if authenticity and motivation were linked. In language learning and teaching, we often hear that there's a strong link between authenticity and motivation. So for, for me, uh, th these three things form a triad, and I name the triad the language impetus triad. Um, and these lectures, uh, there'll be three of these lectures in this series 
So this lecture and then my next lecture on autonomy and then my final lecture on motivation are all linked as a sort of trilogy. So back to authenticity. When we talk about authenticity, you often hear people say the authentic self or the real you. What is the real you? Existential thinkers in the 20th century, um, such as Kierkegaard, uh, Sartre, um, they were very concerned with this idea of what is the real you. And ex this is why uh, existential philosophers were, were very concerned with authenticity. And they were looking for the real authentic self, that, that they were trying to find a way that that self could, could fit within society and be accepted. And they were aware that if you are the real you, if you are your authentic self too much, you're unlikely to be accepted in society. Um, so this, this is sort of an interesting thing because I think that obviously there's a problem there. We don't have one identity. We don't have one real you, real authentic self. There isn't, that isn't a singular thing. There are many identities within each person because we adapt and change our identities depending on who we're talking to and what the situation is. And our identities naturally change and develop over time as we age or as we learn new things or as we experience new things. So I think looking for the authentic self is like chasing rainbows, really, because there are, there's always going to be a new aspect of yourself as long as you keep growing and keep uh, developing as a, as a human. I think that's worth bearing in mind when we think about authenticity. We're not looking for one type of authenticity. We're not looking for a single definitive answer of what authenticity is. We're looking at something that has many sides, many shapes and forms, something that's always evolving, something that's quite dynamic. So when we approach authenticity, it's best not to think of it as a singular item, but something, something that's kind of moving all the time. So this is kind of the paradox of authenticity. It's often easier to define what is not authentic than it is to define what is authentic. We can often say, yes, that's that's a fake, that's not real. We can look at a textbook and uh, say, well, that doesn't look like very natural language or, you know, this script is designed around a grammar point, so this is not authentic language. But how can we identify what actually is authentic language? That's much trickier. What's authenticity when we're talking about language teaching and learning? This is another big question that we need to ask. Um, I've done quite a lot of different studies and different research into this area, and I tend to ask my students uh, various questions about what they believe uh, to be uh, related to authenticity. And I've worked with teachers and students over the past few years trying to get a better understanding of this question. So, um, one famous paper in this area comes from 2007, written by Alex Gilmore, who's now at Tokyo University. And he looked at over a hundred years worth of uh, literature on the topic in language teaching, and he identified eight different uh, definitions of authenticity. If you're interested in knowing more about these eight definitions, uh, I've simplified them here a little bit. Um, and please look at the original paper. The first definition that he found is, is what I refer to as the native definition. And as we've already talked about, the, the native speaker uh, is um, it's a problematic term. You know, what's a native speaker? It's very difficult to kind of uh, identify what a native speaker is. And obviously it's got a lot of problems because of the privilege associated with people whose first language is English. We talked about the different hierarchies of uh, of speakers and the social class and the prestige varieties of, of certain types of standard language. So this native speaker definition is obviously not really useful and it's 
it's it, it's only going to perpetuate this these inequalities that we see in language teaching at the moment. The second definition, the real definition, refers to whether the uh, whether the language or the material was designed for a real purpose, a real communicative purpose. But again, that doesn't use the word native, but it tends to gravitate towards native speaking countries, so-called native speaking countries, uh, countries where English is a dominant first language. And um, again, it sort of, it, it creates uh, a bit of, it, it gravitates towards those varieties and disempowers uh, English as an international language and those who speak English as a second or other language. Another definition refers to the self. It's to do with whether you personally find something authentic or not, how you interact with it. The next definition is related to the classroom. Uh, and there's another definition specific to the task that is used with the materials. Uh, there's a, a social aspect. Again, this relates to the classroom uh, in some ways, but also uh, more broadly. There's one definition that relates specifically to assessments. Those of you who know about uh, validity in language testing will know the concept of, assess of authenticity when you're talking about language testing is very important. So there's a specific definition just for language testing. And then the final definition relates to culture. And uh, that's for if, you're, if you want to be validated and, and seen as becoming a part of a certain culture, um, you know, if you say you want to go and live in another country and speak that language and be seen as, as a member of that culture. These eight definitions, they're all interrelated. Um, but I think for our purposes, it, it probably helps just to simplify it even more. So for me, I, I believe that those eight definitions are very, very good. However, we can simplify it further by... Uh, talking about the debate on authenticity as having two basic strands. There's the existential uh, aspect and the practical aspect of authenticity. The existential aspect relates to um, authenticity as a philosophical concept um, to do with self and society. And then the practical aspect relates to authenticity as something that you try to teach something related to materials or tasks, something that we can try to bring into the classroom. And it seems to me that uh, people often think that these two strands cannot come together. However, I completely disagree with that. I think that in order to make authenticity a useful term, we need to bring these two strands together. Otherwise, uh, they, 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 the word authenticity is not useful. When uh, we're talking about authenticity, uh, it often gets tied up, as I've said, with um, native speakers and native speakerism. And uh, this leads to something uh, that Reeves and Medgies call self-discrimination. So this is when uh, people who have learned a language or speak a language as a second language tend to be harder or more pass stricter judgments on people who also speak the language as a second language. Um, in their research, Reeves and Meggies found that uh, people who, who uh, teach in their second language are more likely to be asked questions or challenged than people who teach in their first language. Another aspect of discrimination is this, you know, this idea of correctness and correct English. And as we talked about in previous lessons, who has ownership over English? Um, this is a postcard, uh, a photograph of a postcard sent from somebody in Argentina to their friend in the US. And somewhere along the way of after sending this postcard, uh, somebody, perhaps, perhaps, a, uh, perhaps a postal worker, although we don't know, somebody decided to correct the English of this person and they corrected it in red pen, and then they also wrote P.S. Learn English, um, which I think shows the kind of elitism 
uh, connected with with authenticity. When we start thinking about correctness, we start thinking about what's right and what's wrong, and we t start talking about standards. This is why uh, in my book I've said that all Englishes are equal, but some varieties are more equal than others. So this is related to the point that we discussed in previous lessons when we talked about Raj Katru and Randolph Quirk's World Englishes debate. We discussed that Raj Katru won the debate. He, he had more citations to his work. His ideas seem to have been picked up more. But of course, it seems that Quirk is the one who actually, uh, whose, who, whose ideas, the idea of a monochrome standard, that's what's been done in language classrooms around the world. If you pick up a textbook, it tends to feature one dominant variety of English rather than the many different varieties that Catru was um, advocating for. So what happens when you start talking about authenticity and materials? As I've shown, authenticity is, is a quite a philosophical concept. You know, it's, it's, it, it's even complicated just talking about artwork uh, and artifact authenticity. But when we're talking about ourselves fitting into society, um, learning another language and another culture and, and, and communicating with other people using language, uh, authenticity is a very complicated and very complex concept. So how does it relate to materials? The word authentic materials is, is quite common in English language teaching. And so what do they look like? Well, often if you... Uh, think of authentic materials, I think the most common idea is probably a newspaper or something like that. And the teacher gets hold of a newspaper and um, uses it for a lesson. So here's a definition of authentic materials from the uh, Dictionary of Applied Linguistics by Richards and Schmidt. Uh, and there's a 2018 version of this book now, and I checked and the definition is still the same in that too. Um, what they say is that authentic materials are not originally developed for pedagogical purposes, such as the use of magazines, newspapers, advertisements, news reports, or songs. So again, this concept that newspapers are authentic. And it's almost as if you can just sort of pick an apple or some fruit and take it to the classroom and it would still uh, retain its freshness and ripeness, um, you know. But that doesn't work. That's an extrapolation technique. So when you pick an apple from a tree and take it to the classroom, it's still an apple and the use is still the same. You're still supposed to eat it. But when you pick a newspaper from another context um, then and bring it to the classroom, hoping for its authenticity to stay intact. I'm afraid that you're changing the context and you're changing the use. So you're extrapolating that material from one context to the next. And in that process of extrapolation, it loses its authenticity. It's no longer designed for its original purpose. And... Uh, this new context that it's in, it has very little meaning. It has very little reason to be there. Why would you take, uh, you know, you wouldn't, why would you take a newspaper and take it to a classroom and hope that the authenticity remains the same when people's reasons for interacting with it is completely different? People's connections with it is completely different. I refer to this as the classic definition of authenticity. And I mean that classic in the sense of a classic car. It's, you know, it's got historical value, but it certainly isn't useful in today's world, in today's uh, international, global uh, uses of English in, in particular. Uh, we don't have any room left for this classic, outdated definition of authenticity. The other problem with this idea is that the this kind of real definition of authenticity, it, it quite easily gets linked up, again, as I've said, with the native speaker definition. The, the real definition gravitates 
towards cultures where the in- English is the first language, the native speaking definitions, native speaking cultures. And so that leads to this kind of classic definition uh, of authenticity that's not very useful. And I noticed that even recently, the UCLA's Language Materials Project, they define authentic materials as materials that were originally intended for native speakers. They're actually using the word native speakers there. And um, I was quite surprised to find this uh, this this uh, clear mention that authentic materials were related to native speakers, because obviously the word native speakers is very problematic. A much more useful definition is this one from Tomlinson and Masuhara, who say that authentic materials are designed not to transmit declarative knowledge about the target language, but rather to provide an experience of the language in use. It might also be helpful to think of um, authenticity and distinguish it from another concept which Henry Widdison calls genuineness. So a newspaper can be genuine, but it might not be authentic. So for Widdison, genuineness is the characteristic of the passage or the text and is an absolute quality, as in it doesn't change. So if you take the newspaper away from its original context and bring it to the classroom, it retains its genuineness because that's absolute. However, the authenticity, that's a characteristic of the relationship between the passage and the reader, and it has to do with appropriate response. So in other words, uh, when you bring that newspaper into the classroom, it's still a genuine newspaper, but is it is it an, an example of authentic language? That, that happens through a process uh, of interaction with the text, and this process of interaction is sometimes referred to as authentication. Now, uh, Leo Van Leer did a lot of uh, disc- a lot of work on this concept, the process of authentication, and this is also where my own work has picked up as well. So, for Leo Van Leer, authentication is basically a personal process of engagement. It's reasonable to suggest that the teacher's authenticity may stimulate authenticity in the students as well. So in other words, if you are able to be authentic yourself, uh, then your students uh, can also learn in an authentic way. My own contribution to the authenticity debate was to create uh, what I what I call the authenticity continuum. And... Um, as I said early on at the start, when, when, when we're trying to define authenticity, we're not trying to get one single definition, um, but we're trying to actually th- approach authenticity from many different perspectives and many different sides. So for me, I think it's easiest to approach authenticity from both a social and contextual point of view. And in the uh, contextual axis, you have the use domain and the learning context. So the use domain is where you intend to use the language um, when you've finished learning the language or uh, when you leave the classroom. Where are you going to actually use the language? The learning context, of course, is where you are learning. And that's important to bear in mind, too, because we often have assessments. We have criteria. We have things that we need to pass Um, So when we're learning and teaching, we need to bear in mind both the learning context and the, the the future use domain. Use domain uh, is a term that I've taken from language assessment. Uh, On the social axis, you've got the individual level of authenticity. So how much you personally engage with something or authenticate it or find it meaningful to you on a personal, individual level. And then uh, on the other side of that is the community level, the people around you, the people you're going to speak with, the people who are going to listen to your speech. And I think if we consider all of these factors together, then we can get a, a more clear picture 
of what authenticity might look like. Uh, authenticity having these, you know, very distinct domains uh, that we need to consider all together. And so the more, the, the stronger something is on each of these domains, the more authentic we can say it is. Um, but it's impossible to say that something is authentic or inauthentic completely um, unless we analyze it and look at it from these uh, context-specific and social-specific uh, areas. So it's going to be different. Authenticity will be different for different people in different times and different contexts. Okay, now um, this quote from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre about how if you seek authenticity for authenticity's sake, you are no longer authentic. I think that this is an important point to bear in mind. However, I must say I disagree with this. I think that the way that we create authenticity in language learning and teaching is actually by actively trying to create a culture of authenticity in our classrooms. To do this, we need to give students opportunities to personalise the language, personalise the things they're saying, personalise the way they react to things. Um, we do this by giving them more choices over what kind of learning materials they use and how they use them. And we do this by trying to get them to engage at a personal level in using the language. As going back to Tomlinson and Masuhara's definition, trying to provide an experience of the language in use. Now, if you want a simplified definition of what authenticity is, uh, for me, authenticity is the uh, degree of a congruence between your uh, actions and your beliefs. So if you, if you, everyone has a philosophy about how they should be behaving or how they should be doing something, and learning is no different. Um, whether or not you're you're aware of it, as a teacher or as a learner, you have a belief about the best way learning should be done, or the way that you want to learn, or the way that you want to teach. So if you are teaching and learning in a way that matches your philosophy about the best way to learn and teach, then you can say that that is authentic. So this is um, the degree of congruence between your actions and your beliefs. And this was actually um, a quote that I took from another book by Vanini and Burgess, and I'll put the link in the in the video at the bottom. Um, so what does this have to do with language learning and teaching? Well, I think it has everything to do with language learning and teaching. Personally, myself, I think that um, authenticity is a key to maintaining motivation to keep studying a language. Learning a language is hard, requires a lot of effort. And if you don't have that personal connection to the language, if you don't have that authentic link between you and this strange foreign language, then uh, you can forget it. You won't really get anywhere. And things that make me so happy are when I've met people who have, have learned another language and it's become a huge part of them. Uh, I've spoken to people who who learned English, uh, for example, and they told me that th the English language is their best method for expressing themselves. Uh, they said that they weren't really free in their society to express themselves in their first language, but English allows them to express themselves more internationally, and it's changed who they are and helped them discover who they really are more. So I think that English and learning another language um, are very empowering things, and I hope that I can uh, finally authenticate myself when I speak foreign languages too, and I hope that you can authenticate yourself uh, in whatever languages you speak. I think that we need to have that sense of personal identity in the language in order to be authentic. So, on reflection, I've talked today about the nature of authenticity, the difficulties we have defining authenticity, saying what's 
authentic and what's not. I've talked a little bit about the philosophical background to authenticity. I've talked about uh, the different definitions of authenticity in language teaching and some of the problems with those definitions and the way that they tend to gravitate towards native speakers uh, or L L1 speakers. And um, then I've tried to present uh, a case for making authenticity both philosophical and practical, bringing these two strands together so that we can actually have authenticity as a useful term uh, and not something that's too philosophical and vague to understand or too simplified and practical to be of any real value or use. Well, next week I'm going to be talking about autonomy in language learning, discussing how uh, what we need to know in order to take responsibility for our own learning. And as I said, this will link in with today's lecture on authenticity. Anyway, that's everything for today. So thank you very much and see you later, alligator.